Has the traditional family unit, or the concept of family in general, become obsolete? Like it or not, there is no debate that the structure of the average family is very different than 50, 25, or even 10 years ago. In 2014, Time Magazine published an article on the changing family structure. Its title says it all. There is no longer any such thing as a typical family. The article begins by establishing the increasingly common sentiment. Pretty much everyone agrees that the era of the nuclear family has declined to the point of no return. The big question is, what is replacing it? Now a new study suggests that nothing is, or rather, that a whole grab bag of family arrangements are. Yes, society's view of family is changing. At what cost? At what cost to the individuals immediately affected, especially children? And at what cost to humanity as a whole, as we try to retain society while removing one of its core foundations, the family? On today's edition of Tomorrow's World, we'll see the side effects of removing the traditional family structure. Stay tuned as we ask, does family matter? Welcome to Tomorrow's World. The statement that the structure of the family unit is changing at a rapid pace likely does not surprise you. We don't need to go far to see examples of this change in the world all around. We don't even need to leave our home to see drastic changes in families pictured on modern television shows and movies. The family has been the chief building block of society throughout history, and we are currently in the midst of the largest social experiment ever undertaken. Can society survive without family? Can we simply change the definition of family without having dramatic and far-reaching effects? Should we take the stance, live and let live, someone else's living arrangements don't affect me? If the traditional family structure has been a foundation of society, how many strong families does it take to maintain that society? And what happens when that foundation is removed? It can be easy to think that we are at the tail end of these changes as what could possibly change next? The New York Times describes how even the experts who study these changes are astonished at the speed with which they are occurring. Researchers who study the structure and evolution of the American family express unsullied astonishment at how rapidly the family has changed in recent years. It's a mistake to think that this is the end point of enormous change. We are still very much in the midst of it. All evidence points to these changes continuing to surge forward, despite our reluctance to accept them. Throughout today's program, we'll be offering you a free copy of our instructive DVD, A Culture in Crisis. While the family structure is one pillar of our society, which is changing at a rapid pace, with severe consequences, it is not the only one. This DVD highlights several aspects of Western culture which are in crisis. Keep a pen and paper or your phone handy and be sure to order your free copy. As we begin, it's important to understand that change is not necessarily a bad thing. We'll be looking at side effects of these changes, which all too often have been relegated to fine print and brushed aside. But on the other hand, we cannot pretend that the 1950s, 1920s, or any other decade was perfect and is the ideal situation to which we should return. The 2016 Canadian Census paints a picture of the current state of families in Canada. In the opening of today's program, I quoted a Time Magazine article which described a grab bag of new family arrangements. It may surprise you to learn that the most common type of household is one featuring someone living alone. For the first time in the country's history, the number of one-person households has surpassed all other types of living situations. The same census also reveals the staggering rise in common-law relationships in place of marriage and that 19.2% of children aged 14 and under are growing up in single-parent households, while 30% are living in non-traditional family arrangements. This is just a glimpse of the changes occurring all around us. What are the consequences of devaluing the traditional family structure? Before I continue, I want to mention that the statistics and information we'll be looking at are broad and general statements. The fact that, in most cases, being raised by two biological parents is ideal does not nullify the fact that there are single mothers, single fathers, 
stepfathers and stepmothers, adoptive parents, foster parents, grandparents, and others who have done tremendous jobs making the most of less than ideal situations. However, we also cannot fall into the trap of viewing all the various scenarios as equal. Take for example this finding reported in the Daily Signal on the decline of marriage and the rise of new families. The latest national incidence report from the Administration on Children and Families found that children living with their married, biological parents had the lowest rates of abuse across all the categories of maltreatment studied. Again, this is not to say that all or even most step-parents or individuals living with their common law partner's children are abusive or that abuse does not occur in homes boasting both biological parents. But the difference here is actually quite telling. Compared to children living with married biological parents, those whose single parent had a live-in partner had more than eight times the rate of maltreatment overall, over ten times the rate of abuse, and nearly eight times the rate of neglect. The traditional family structure is safest. It is also the healthiest, according to a study performed at Rice University. Research shows that children living in a traditional two-parent married household are less likely to be obese with a 17% obesity rate than children living with cohabitating parents who have a 31% obesity rate. The obesity rate for children in non-traditional families is nearly double. I should also mention that the researchers accounted for factors such as physical activity, socioeconomic status, and even diet. From time to time, I am in awe of how scientific studies can prove something that had already been assumed to be true for centuries, yet state it as if it is some sparkling new revelation. For reasons we cannot fully measure, there appears to be something about people who marry and have a child that is fundamentally different than the other groups. Yes, there is something fundamentally different and wonderful about the marriage relationship that is a tremendous benefit to the married couple and to the children raised in such a household. Among children raised in single parent households, however, boys perform significantly less well than their sisters in school, and their employment rate as young adults was lower. Boys born to disadvantaged families, with disadvantages measured here by mother's marital status and education, have higher rates of disciplinary problems, lower achievement scores, and fewer high school completions. The traditional family structure is safer, promotes better health, and increases likelihood of educational and career success. We don't even have time to go into the reduced crime and drug usage rates of those raised in traditional families. The benefits of strong families don't end with the family itself. In the next portion of our program, we'll see the significant impact strong families have on society and the devastating effects of the current decline. But first, I want you to have the opportunity to order our free DVD titled, A Culture in Crisis. This DVD consists of three Tomorrow's World telecasts. Two of these telecasts, A Brazen New World and Tiny Fingers and Toes, looks at specific ways in which the evolving culture surrounding families is in crisis. As always, this information is yours free of charge. Let me tell you how you can get this exciting DVD free. Just dial the number on your screen and ask for A Culture in Crisis. You can also order online at TWCanada.org. There's no catch. We simply believe that watching the three Tomorrow's World telecasts contained on this DVD will affect how you view the seemingly inescapable changes being promoted in today's world. So call us now or visit us online to get your free copy. If you missed our contact information this time, I will give it again later in the program. Welcome back. We've just touched on the rapid pace at which the traditional family structure is changing. We've seen that the benefits of being a part of a traditional family unit are immense. We've been looking at general trends, understanding of course that there are many out there who have succeeded despite being in less than ideal circumstances, and others who have failed despite being in a positive environment. Environment does not guarantee outcome, but it certainly helps. The evidence speaks for itself. In terms of providing a safe, healthy environment to promote success and discourage crime and drug use, family does matter. It's not surprising then that the United Nations has summarized the importance of family as follows. The family in all its forms is the cornerstone of the world community. 
In a broad sense, families can and do educate, train, motivate, and support their individual members, thereby investing in their future growth and acting as a vital resource for development. It is my sincere hope that those watching will recognize the importance of family, especially younger viewers who may be wondering if marriage is a worthwhile endeavor or what environment may be best to raise children. You are at the precipice, facing some important decisions that will affect not only you for the rest of your life, but any potential children you may have for the rest of their lives as well. I hope you'll take these findings to heart. If you are not in such a situation, the questions may be arising in your mind, does family matter for me? If you live in and interact with the society around you, the changes that are occurring are going to impact you in many ways. Maclean's magazine hints at the magnitude of the current crisis. Marriage may not matter as much as it once did to young couples, but it matters a lot to society at large. Married couples are a foundation of the economy. They earn, save, and spend more than their unmarried counterparts. Writing for the New York Times, former United States Secretary of Education, William Bennett makes plain the benefits reaped by a society with strong families. I am the product of divorce and several stepfathers, but I still believe in the importance of the traditional family because of the facts and the record. The family is the nucleus of civilization and the basic social unit of society. If we have stronger families, we will have stronger schools, stronger churches, and stronger communities, with less poverty and less crime. The family is the linchpin of society, both economically and socially. The term nucleus is an apt description. The results when one splits are undeniably devastating. When an abundance of them split, it's catastrophic. Society is dependent on relationships. Our ability to sympathize with, relate to, and sometimes simply tolerate our neighbors, coworkers, and friends enables society to develop and thrive. The most basic of human relationships exist within the family. We learn how to work together, how to overcome disagreements, how to forgive. We learn how to encourage and instruct. We learn how to lead and to defer. Strong family relationships also allow us to build larger community networks. Picture a family with three young children. Each child has a network of friends they interact with on a daily basis at school. From time to time, each child brings friends home who then interact with their siblings. If the middle child is bringing home a friend, the younger child is learning how to interact with older, non-related children, and the older sibling is learning to interact with younger non-related children. The middle child is learning how to host and how to be a conduit for these expanding relationships. Likewise, when mom and dad invite other adults over for dinner, the children gain experience relating to non-related adults. Each of these instances allows children to develop and foster relationship skills with the family forming not only the earliest learning grounds, but also the basis for expanding their own personal relationship network. The family relationship is the first intimate relationship of your life, and you apply what you learn to later relationships. It's also where you may learn how to constructively communicate, or perhaps the inverse, to yell and scream when you have a disagreement. Those are the skills you learn from the family, and you will apply in later relationships. Many of these relationship skills are being eroded by decline in the traditional family structure. The rise of social media and personal technology can amplify this as they allow us to close ourselves off from those around us. This is not to say that technology itself is bad, However, technology makes it very easy for someone to withdraw into their own peer group. Strong families help to counter this rising phenomenon. Another key component of the traditional family structure is longevity. Peer groups change over the course of our lives. As individuals grow older and their life situations change, people come in and out of their lives. This is a gigantic flaw in the growing movement of family is whoever you choose it to be. If you are simply choosing who your family is, there remains the choice for them to no longer be family. Obviously, marriage is a choice, but when done properly, that choice is in the context of a lifelong commitment. It is often said that one should never bring up politics or religion at a family dinner. You and the other members of your family may not see eye to eye on those topics. When we disagree with acquaintances, 
it can be normal to distance ourselves and to avoid situations where those topics may come up. Family ties should be more difficult to sever. Being a part of a family unit means learning when and how to disagree with someone, knowing when a topic should be left alone entirely, or certain conversations should be left for a more appropriate time. We learn to get over things, to overcome differences, and to work with people who may not agree with us, even on some very important topics. It is no coincidence that the decline of the family unit and the increasing polarization of society have come hand in hand. People don't know how to disagree with each other anymore. Every opposing viewpoint is now an irreconcilable difference and people withdraw into their own networks of whoever agrees with them. Are you fed up with the increased polarization and divisiveness we are seeing in the world around us? The decline of the family unit has played a vital role in that change. When we return, we will view some interesting studies showing how people view the traditional family structure and complaints from researchers at a top university that one vital aspect of the decline of the family unit is being overlooked. Lastly, we'll look to an ancient source which outlines millennia ago that family does matter. Before we continue, I want to give you the opportunity to dive deeper into studying the crisis facing our society. This DVD, A Culture in Crisis, will help you to see and understand the changes occurring all around us. I hope you take us up on this offer and call or write for your free copy. I'll be back to continue our look at the importance of family in just a few moments. To request your free copy, call the number displayed on the screen and ask for a culture in crises. You can also order online at twcanada.org. Have you ever asked, where is the world headed? What does the future hold for me? Or if morality even matters anymore? Tomorrow's World magazine answers these questions and more and will also be sent to you free of charge. Call us right now or visit us online to get your free DVD, A Culture in Crises, and Tomorrow's World magazine. Enjoy the rest of the program. On today's program, we're asking, does family matter? We've seen overwhelming evidence that the traditional family structure is vital in establishing a safe, healthy environment for children. We've also seen how the family unit acts as the basic building block of society. The world is already feeling the effects of ignoring the importance of the traditional family. One can only imagine what the future holds if the next generation places even less importance on family relationships. Considering what we have discovered, it may come as a surprise that so many people view these changes with ambivalence or even support. In an in-depth report from the Pew Research Center on the rise of new families, even included a bullet point in its executive summary, an ambivalent public. The public's response to changing marital norms and family forms reflects a mix of acceptance and unease. On the troubled side of the ledger, seven in 10, 69%, say the trend toward more single women having children is bad for society. And 61% say that a child needs both a mother and father to grow up happily. On the accepting side, only a minority say the trends toward more cohabitation without marriage, 43%, more unmarried couples raising children, 43%, are bad for society. Relatively few say any of these trends are good for society but many say they make little difference. In fact, many will dismiss the evidence we've shown on today's program as only being relevant for children and that once we're adults, the need for family is minimized and can be replaced by close friends. While that may work for some in theory, the research shows that it is not fulfilling the needs in reality. In conducting its study, the Pew Research Center asked, Suppose someone you know had a serious problem and needed either financial help or caregiving. How obligated would you feel to provide assistance if that person were your? The results asked about include parent, grown child, grandparent, brother or sister, spouse or partner's parent, grown stepchild, stepparent, step or half sibling, and finally, best friend. Best friend finished last on the list with only 39% saying they would feel very obligated to provide assistance. Compare that to 64% for brother or sister, 77% for grown child, or 83% for parent. 
it seems the family relationship truly is different. Sadly, most studies on the family are leaving out an essential element when trying to understand the changing dynamics. Consider this remark from ScienceDaily.com. Previous attachment research has demonstrated the importance of the mother-infant relationship to children's emotional development. But there is still relatively little research on the role of fathers, the marital relationship, and the family as a whole. A result of the increase of children being raised solely by their mothers is that most of the focus has been on the role mothers play in raising children. Their role is vital and must not be overlooked. But it certainly appears as though much of this is being done to justify the current trend rather than to examine the best path forward. Again, mothers are essential. But let's notice this quote regarding a study showing that parenting research often overlooks fathers. Despite robust evidence of fathers' impact on children and mothers, Engaging with fathers is one of the least well-explored and articulated aspects of parenting interventions, says lead author Catherine Panterbrick, professor of anthropology, health, and global affairs at Yale University. It is therefore critical to evaluate implicit and explicit biases against men in their role as fathers manifested in current approaches to research, intervention, and policy. The last book of the Old Testament, in its final few verses contains a stern warning as well as a message of hope. It indicates that there will be a desperate need for healing the relationships between family members. It also indicates that there will be a cry to revive the family unit. Malachi 4, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers lest I come and strike the earth with a curse." The fact that society is impacted by the strength or weakness of the family unit was known centuries ago. The reality is that right from creation, it is clear that man was built to excel within a family structure. The second chapter of Genesis contains the well-known story of God using Adam's rib to create Eve. Adam was longing for companionship, but for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. Adam's reaction was pure elation when God brought Eve to him. He immediately recognized the importance of their relationship, the creation of the first human family. God saw fit to ensure that two of the Ten Commandments are directed at strengthening the family unit. God wants societies to be successful. He wants strong families. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not commit adultery. This book also contains keys which can help you to be a better father, mother, brother, sister, husband, wife, son, or daughter. It can help you to prepare for a future family. In recent decades, the family unit has come under attack. I don't say this to belittle those who find themselves in a less than ideal situation. But family does matter. It is the bedrock of society and the linchpin of successful communities. Family is the best environment for raising children and shaping future generations. The relationship between family and the religion described in the Bible is one of significant importance. The two support each other in tremendous ways. Throughout the program, I've been encouraging you to take us up on our offer of this free DVD, A Culture in Crisis. As we have seen, the decline in family is a devastating crisis facing our current culture. One of the telecasts on this DVD, What Happened to God, highlights another crisis, the outright rejection of morality, rule of law, and the existence of a creator. Call and order your free copy today. As we conclude today's program, I'd like to encourage you to stay tuned for tomorrow's World Answers, which will begin in just a few moments. From all of us here at Tomorrow's World, Thank you for tuning in. We hope you've enjoyed the program and that you found it to be profitable. Tune in next time as Gerald Weston, Stuart Wachowicz, and I will continue to bring you wonderful news of tomorrow's world. To learn more about today's topic, visit TWCanada.org. You can also order by calling us at 1-866-784-7895 or by writing us at tomorrow's world P.O. Box 409, Mississauga, Ontario, 
L5M0P6. Welcome to Tomorrow's World Answers, where we answer your questions straight from the Bible. Several times in the New Testament, Christ and the Apostles refer to a peculiar instruction. What does it mean to be in the world, but not of it? This teaching is emphasized in the book of Revelation. And I heard another voice in heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. What is this saying? What does it mean to come out of the world? Let's clarify by looking at other scriptures on this topic. Colossians 2 verse 8, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Here Paul states that a Christian should be distancing himself from the philosophies, practices, and traditions of men that are in fact contrary to the way of life God describes in the Bible. Thus, coming out of the world simply means making a decision to no longer live one's life according to man's culture, but by God's culture. This does not mean leaving civilization and becoming a hermit. Note Christ's statement as recorded by John. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Jesus did not ask his Father to remove his followers from society, but to help them live a proper life in current society. After all, Christ told us in Matthew 5 verse 14 to be examples or lights to the world, and this cannot happen if we remove ourselves. God even says his followers should be ambassadors of a better way of life to mankind. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. A good ambassador lives within society, representing his government, but not being involved in the local issues as he represents a different country or kingdom. He must be a polite representative whose lifestyle is exemplary, reflecting positively on the nation and culture he represents. So we, who wish to follow the biblical instruction, must represent God's culture politely and respectfully in a world that is immersed in a culture foreign to God's revealed way of life. To submit a question for the show, email us at twanswers at tomorrowsworld.org. Be sure to watch us online at twcanada.org or by searching Tomorrow's World Answers on YouTube. You will also receive a free subscription to Tomorrow's World magazine, revealing God's principles for leading an abundant and happy life, while providing insight into current and future events. At our website, you can also watch this and many more Tomorrow's World programs. Call 1-866-784-7895. This program is a production of The Living Church of God.